My name is Dave Ackley. I'm in the computer science department at the University of New Mexico where I teach programming classes a lot, mostly in Java these days, and do research in artificial life, which for me is about how machines and living things are related. Now, they might not seem that related outside of science fiction. I mean, gazelles bounding on the plane don't seem much like the PC in the den running a spreadsheet. But I think living systems and machines or computational systems are going to end up being the same thing up in the big picture. It might not seem that way now, but I think that's maybe because we've got some kind of wrong ideas about what a machine really is. Once a machine starts to acquire new programming on the fly from its environment, it stands to lose exactly that rigidity, predictability, and obliviousness that we had taken as defining a machine. So shouldn't we call it something else? Life? Artificial? Biology has known this forever. We're just beginning to think about it. Computation. Living. It's interesting. Jordan Pollack, and I'm a professor at Brandeis University, which is just outside of Boston. My work has been across different parts of the field in natural language and neural networks and dynamical systems and fractals. And most of my work for the last 25 years or so has been in evolution. I worked with my students and postdocs on a field of uh, I call co-evolutionary robotics, and that was the idea that rather than having engineers build a robot and giving it to programmers to program the robot, that in nature there never is a body without a brain. So the idea I had was to use a co-evolutionary arms race between a simple body and a simple brain and a more complex body and a more complex brain, basically climbing up the complexity. So we saw when the first generation uh, of Lego robots, we saw uh, the emergence of cantilevers and triangles, and in the first generation of uh, golem robots, we saw ratchets and breaststrokes and rolling and all sorts of different kinds of locomotion evolving. And it was seen before in Carl Sims's work in 1994 which was a tour de force that no one was able to replicate for 10 years. But he showed the construction of these uh, artificial life computer graphic creatures that moved in amazingly lifelike ways. So the interaction between the physics and the evolution is a form of invention. I call it the Sims effect. What are these creatures? They're virtual creatures. They're virtual entities that can move and behave in a simulated world of physics. What's virtual? Virtual, in this case, is, is digital. They're all in simulations in a computer. If I were to try to hook together these sensors and neurons and effectors myself, I might never come up with a good solution that could make this thing swim. But evolution can still do it. Like, so it's like nature, you just, you don't understand it. Right, in, in a sense it is. This tape shows a number of creatures that resulted in simulated evolutions. It shows the results after a number of generations. Here's some that are evolved for swimming ability. So now these are given land physics, friction and gravity, and selected for their ability to walk. And some very simple strategies came up which could still propel the creatures across the ground. The final challenge for these creatures was actually to compete against each other. Here's these 
creatures which figured out how to roll towards the cube. A few more generations later, though, a strategy came up which would not just get to the cube, but shove the opponent away. And so that was winning for quite a while. Here's two of that same strategy going against each other. And I actually ran this simulation for longer than it was supposed to go because I was curious who would win in the end because they seemed to really be battling it out. Where is this all going to go to? Well, one thing that I would like to do is instead of giving them uh, a simple world that's defined and set up and having only one or two creatures in the world at once, I think it would be interesting to, to make the entire evolutionary process all in one physical simulation. So the creatures are all running around together with their children and relatives. And then you could have uh, more different types of things uh, occur, such as cooperation and communication between creatures and perhaps some social systems uh, could evolve. And there's just a lot of potential for uh, the results if you just let it happen instead of defining the goals or even defining a competition. evolutionary biologist and I've been working in tropical rainforests for 20 years. I went to the rainforest to study evolution, but I found it very difficult because evolution is so slow. It's a process that occurs over many generations, millions of years. So I got the idea of trying to start evolution in the computer. Many people want to know how can we guide evolution to produce these programs. And I take the rather radical view that it's best to keep our hands off completely and let evolution by natural selection find its own solutions and its own problems. So I advocate creating large biodiversity reserves for digital organisms, which would consist of vast regions of cyberspace where digital organisms can evolve freely on their own in natural digital ecosystems and let evolution find its own solutions. I believe that there's this great chasm between art and science, and by placing myself at this, this midpoint in the world of computers, I can translate uh, or feed off complex scientific ideas and then present them as art. Having defined the structure, which is a computer program, I then put it into another computer program, which essentially mutates the structure. So each of the mutations is slightly different to the parent structure. I then look at this family of mutations and pick one, kill off the rest, and then breed again from that new offspring. So what happens is that as I evolve and select the forms, a little bit like a gardener trying to grow the perfect rose for a flower show, things gradually change over time. So what I'm doing is using evolution creatively to create unexpected forms. So it's, I'm interacting with evolution. That would be said, the mechanisms that I saw 
Carl Sims saw had the order of 10 plus or minus moving parts. Whereas in real life, the eye or the wings flapping, whatever, has hundreds to thousands of moving parts. So again, it's sort of the, the same question as deep evolution is how can we get something to run without reaching equilibrium early such that complexity develops and develops over time. So when we do that, we'll have robots that are extremely complex and then we'll face another problem of, well, how do we manufacture these robots? Well, I have an answer for that too, but a longer one.